Muchas gracias. Es, es un gran honor estar aquí con ustedes hoy. En, hoy es el Día de la Tierra y pues estamos hablando del océano porque vivimos en un, un planeta que pues es como una canica azul. Y tengo dos metas hoy. La primera meta es robar un pedacito de tu corazón y dejar una canica azul en su lugar. And the other goal today is to completely change the way you see water for the rest of your life. So that every time you see water in a fountain, in a bathtub, in a lake, in a river, in the ocean, you will think about it differently. You will think about Blue Mind. You'll think about yourself and how the water makes you feel. And then begin to change the way you interact with the water. That's a big goal, I think. Maybe it's a little too, too brave of me, but I like big, big ideas and I like trying difficult things. So if you'd like to be in touch, if you'd like to send an email, or if you use Twitter or Facebook or Skype or any other technologies to communicate, please jot down my email address and my Twitter address and stay in touch. I like conversation and I like interaction and I like to advance these ideas in any way possible. Whether you're an engineer, a, a neuroscientist, a biologist, a sociologist, maybe you're not even sure who you are yet. I want to continue this conversation because it's one of the most important conversations that's happening right now on our planet. I want you to think about yourself as a new person in relation to our water planet. I want you to understand your own brain in a different way after today. And then use that knowledge to advance our, our collective work for our ocean planet. Now, I fell in love with nature when I was a kid. When I was 11 years old, I remember this moment like yesterday. I remember standing in the Rocky Mountains in Wyoming. I can feel the grass on my bare, under my bare feet. I can smell the mountain air. I can feel the water in that cold lake. I can taste the trout that I caught in that lake. My, my body and my mind and my senses were completely alive. And I remember it clearly. It's one of my favorite memories. And on that day, I fell deeper in love with nature. And maybe that has something to do with why we're here together today. Maybe that day set some things in motion. I don't know. It's hard to say what, what causes what. But the reality was, in that, at that time, I was more interested in the ocean. And I loved turtles. And, but I don't, have a, I don't have a photograph of myself at that age with a turtle. Otherwise, I would be showing it to you right now. But the best I can do, the best I have is, is that. Mas o menos. That's what I looked like when I was 11 years old. And we used to catch snapping turtles in the Chesapeake Bay. And we would paint numbers on their shells. And then we throw the turtles back in, into the bay. And then sometimes we would recapture those turtles. And sometimes they had numbers on their shells. And then we would use simple algebra to figure out how many turtles, more or less, were in the bay. Now, we were probably way off, but we were doing science. And we didn't even know it. We were playing in, in the bay, in the, in the water. We were playing with sea turtles. We were doing science, and we didn't know it. I'll take this off. And that's what it's all about, enjoying being outside, enjoying doing science, and, and finding the joy in, in that work. Now, I, I love turtles, and I see turtles everywhere. To me, that's a turtle. <laughs> There's another turtle. That turtle lasted for one millisecond, and then it was gone forever, never to be seen again. But for that moment, That was the turtle. There's another one. That one's easier to see. And in a group like this, 
I can always find at least one or two people who look kind of like a turtle. <laughs> and you know who you are. I, I, won't, I won't embarrass you. But I've been told by my wife sometimes that I look a little bit like a turtle. So, you, you know, it's okay. Turtle people unite. <laughs> so I took my passion for turtles. And I, and I remember standing in my living room with my father. And I said, Dad, I'm going to get my PhD. I'm going to become a doctor of sea turtles. And he said, what? Because <laughs> he, in his world, your choices were engineer, doctor, businessman, or lawyer. Four choices, not five. <laughs> sea turtle guy was not on that list. <laughs> So I stood there and he looked at me and he said, son, what are you going to do with sea turtles? And I said, everything. And he looked at me and he said, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> and I said, neither do I, but uh, I'm, I'm going to give it a shot. And so I came to Mexico, my adopted second country and visited every single beach in Mexico. We drove from Texas to Belize, to Guatemala, hasta California. And we visited the entire coast of this beautiful country. And we camped and worked and helped and volunteered and learned from the best sea turtle people in the world here in Mexico. This is the capital of the world for sea turtles. More species and more turtles than any other country in the world. The Australians might want to fight about it, but Mexico will win. Mexico has the best sea turtle abundance and diversity in the world, and with that, the responsibility. So we visited every single beach, took four months, then went back and visited some, some of them again on the Pacific coast, and then settled in on the Baja California Peninsula because there's a big gap in our knowledge of sea turtles. We know a lot about sea turtles when they come up and lay their eggs on the beaches, but very little when they're, they're in the ocean. And they spend 99.9% .9 of their time in the ocean. And Baja California is one of those places where they come from all over the Pacific to feed and to grow and to mature. And then they go back to the places where they were born. So we decided to focus on this, this thousand mile long peninsula. Two states, Baja California, Baja California Sur, as well as Sonora and Sinaloa. My field site is 3,000 miles of coastline. I started a doctoral program and my committee said, you shouldn't do this project. It's too late for the turtles in Baja. They're gone. They're on the edge of extinction. They're ecologically extinct and they will be completely gone in, in a few years. There isn't the capacity to rescue them. You should skip over this project and do something else. Maybe work with fish. Maybe go to Costa Rica. And I said, nope, this is, this is the thing I want to focus on. I was stubborn. And they tried to get me to explain why I was so sure that, that this project of studying and rescuing the sea turtles in Baja was possible. Again, they asked me, what, do you, what are you going to do with sea turtles? How are you going to protect them? These hard questions, same question my father asked. My graduate committee was asking me. They said, the black market and the poaching of sea turtles is enormous. It's very, very strong. How are you going to, how are you going to deal with that? How are you going to change that, young man? You, you can't do that. And the bycatch, turtles getting caught in fishing gear and on a fishing line and on hooks and in nets and in bottom trawlers. They get caught by fishermen who don't intend to catch them. It's, it's an accident, but they still get caught in the gear. It's called bycatch. Pesca de incidental. So the mortality, lots of dead turtles and not a lot of hope. And my committee said, what are you going to do? How, why do you think this is a viable project? They said, it's too late. There isn't time. We're advising you to do something else. And I said, dignity. That's my answer. It's the dignity of the people that I met, the fishermen, sometimes the turtle hunters, 
the people who like to eat sea turtle. But there is dignity, and I thought that was enough to work with. My graduate committee said, are you crazy? You're going to base your PhD research on that? We need some data. We need some hard numbers. What is dignity anyway? It's a fuzzy idea. You can't base your doctoral dissertation on, on something like that. You need, you need data. And I said, well, how about community? Dignity and community. That's what I'm basing this on. They're strong, small coastal communities that I think we can work with. Dignity and community wasn't enough. Working with young people, connecting fishermen and turtle poachers and students with these sea turtles, that didn't make sense to this group of evolutionary biologists. They wanted, they wanted data, they wanted numbers, they wanted DNA. And I said, compassion. I, have this, I feel like there's compassion that we can work with. So dignity and community and compassion. Doesn't that mean something? And to this group of advisors, it didn't mean very much. Those are soft, fuzzy words that don't translate into the scientific community very well. At least they didn't back then. And this idea that our compassion, our dignity, and our working together is real. It's hard science. It can be. And it can really be the thing that drives a success story in conservation. It was something I was very interested in exploring. So over the years, we've, we formed this network of former turtle hunters and fishermen and community members and young people, and we called it Grupo Tortuguero. We met one year, got together, had a meeting, talked about sea turtles, and at the end of the meeting decided, let's meet again the next year. And everybody said, yep, we should meet again. Then we decided, if we're going to meet next year, we need a name. What should our name be? Grupo Tortuguero, turtle group. Simple, very simple. No acronyms, nothing complicated, very simple. Grupo Tortuguero, it's stuck. And Grupo Tortuguero took on this very simple model that I use for every project I work on now. Three parts, the relationships, the network, the understanding, and the sharing. The understanding is the science, the knowledge, the social science, the biological science, the indigenous knowledge, the local knowledge. And then sharing is communication giving it away, spreading it around, sharing it through conversations like this, through television programs, through radio programs, through flyers, through classes in schools, through art projects. And the Grupo Tortuguero has grown over the past 15 years to include 50 communities and thousands of people, dozens of nonprofit organizations and community clubs, and this project just keeps growing. And it's working. We're seeing this movement that's working. Part of what's working is that compassion, the community, and the dignity. And we're seeing the results. We're seeing the Grupo Tortugueros efforts working to restore sea turtle populations. Now, it wasn't all about compassion and dignity and community. We did a lot of science. One of the first things we did is we put this satellite transmitter on a turtle named Adelita. that was named after the daughter of the fisherman, together with a biologist named Antonio Resendiz from Valle de los Angeles, who at the time worked for the Mexican government. We collaborated and put this transmitter on this loggerhead turtle and released her off the Pacific coast of Mexico. And she swam away. And over the course, well, we thought maybe that she would swim, swim across the ocean back to her, her natal beaches. But our advisors said, turtles can't do that. Turtles can't swim across the whole ocean. It's impossible. It's too far. It's 7,000 miles away. And once again, we were being told, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. That's impossible. And we decided once the turtle started to swim, we would share the data on the internet in real time. So this was 1996. And we were told, you can't do that. The turtle can't do that, and you can't do that. You can't share your data on the internet, because somebody will steal it. And I remember thinking, OK, what if somebody steals my turtle data? <laughs> <laughs> will I call the police? <laughs> Report the stolen electrons, the data, the numbers? What would they do with stolen turtle data? Sell it? <laughs> Put it on eBay? Um, 
maybe they would save sea turtles with it. Hmm. Maybe they're smarter than me and they might do some analysis and then we can collaborate. Hmm, there's an idea. So I decided to put it on the internet in real time, which was a revolutionary act in 1996. Nowadays, it's normal. Back then, it was not a good idea, ill-advised. Actually, I was told it was career suicide. So we put Adelita's data online, and millions of people followed her as she swam from the Mexican coast past the Hawaiian Islands all the way to Japan, back to the beaches where she was born. Over the course of 368 days, 7,000 miles, she swam all the way across the Pacific Ocean. So now we rewrote the oceanog oceanography textbooks. We started a, a brand new social network around a sea turtle by sharing the data online, and millions of people became inspired by Adelita's story. Now, just so you know, our team has published a lot of research. And I won't go into all the, the details of sea turtle biology that we've unraveled over the past 20 years. But suffice it to say, this team of researchers is one of the best in the world. We've produced some of the best science on sea turtles that exists in, in the world. And, and this part of Mexico is well known for doing uh, excellent biological and ecological research in the ocean. So we're, we've put Baja California on the map in the scientific community and also shared that data in the process with people who may, may have been school kids or teachers. But science doesn't save turtles. People do. And it was very, very important to connect as many people as possible with the process of doing science. And this partnership with RED, Sustainable Travel, has been critical. So there are people in the world who want to come and see a turtle, who want to participate. And these guys make that possible. They set up a camp, they involve local fishermen in the scientific research, and people come and pay to work side by side. And then they become sea turtle ambassadors. They fall in love with the place, they fall in love with the people, and they fall in love with the animals, and they get connected, they contribute to science, they contribute financially, and it helps out a lot in the communities. We used to understand that it was a struggle between economics, and emotion. You say, well, I love turtles. Well, you know, no, wait a second. Keep the love out of it. Keep your passion out of it. Let's talk about economics. Let's talk about data. But we used to understand that economics and emotion didn't really mix. But now, as economists and neuroscientists, we understand that economics and emotion always work together. Almost all of our decisions have an emotional component. There's a, a growing field called neuroeconomics that recognizes that. That our decisions, whether we realize it or not, have an emotional basis. Our subconscious, all of our experiences, our biases are really hard to keep out of it. And so most people, most of the time, are making economic decisions based on some emotions along with reason and logic. But emotion is a, is a major component. So think about what you had for breakfast today. Did you calculate the calories? Did you calculate how far that food maybe traveled, the food miles? Did you look at the ingredients? And did you understand the chemistry of every ingredient in your breakfast? Did you skip breakfast? Anybody? <laughs> did you have a cup of coffee for breakfast? Some people skip breakfast. and So all of these have an emotional component you're not entirely logical and reasonable, reasonable about even what you have for breakfast. So this understanding that economics and emotion working together is really important. But what, what do we mean by emotion? That's the key question. So what we've seen over the past 20 years or so, 30 years now, is that it's working. The sea turtle population, these black turtles in, in Baja California, that nest in Michoacan, the population is growing. And that has been because of this partnership between the communities in Michoacan and the communities in Baja California, working hard to solve some of these problems, to reduce the threats, and we're seeing the black sea turtle is making a comeback. We're not ready to call it a victory yet, but we're getting there. So there is a bright spot. There is a happy face 
in an ocean of bad news. And if you're an oceanographer, if you're a marine biologist, if you study the environment, you hear the bad news every day. There's always bad news about the environment, about the ocean, about our climate, about our forests. All you do is open the newspaper or look online and you will read new bad news about the environment. So it's nice to celebrate good news when it comes our way once in a while and understand what's going on. But the reality is that we, we are facing an ocean crisis. Our ocean is in trouble. Despite a few good news stories, we've got some big problems. In the United States, our, our budget, I mean our, our GDP, our economy, is around 15 trillion. Just round it up to 15 trillion. The ocean is downstream of that entire economy. Our energy, our clothing, our agriculture, our food, our fishing, everything we do impacts the ocean eventually. The ocean is downstream of our entire economy. Think about that. How we make the energy that we use to move ourselves around. Mostly oil. Oil has a huge impact on the ocean, sometimes more than others. The Gulf of Mexico oil spill was an incredibly huge tragedy. I spent two weeks there trying to help, trying to work on sea turtle rescue, and it was this, probably the saddest two weeks of my life, pulling these animals covered with oil out of the ocean and trying to figure out how to fix them. Um, very difficult, not always successful. And then just imagine that times a billion, literally billions of animals, small and large, being covered with oil. In the US, we spend less than $2 billion protecting the ocean. And that's being very generous. I took all of the data I could find, I added it together, and again, I rounded up. It's being very generous. That's all the, the federal budgets and the NGOs, the nonprofits. All of, this, all of the ocean protection amounts to less than $2 billion. That's a fraction of a percent, one one hundredth of a percent of our GDP, of our gross domestic product. A tiny percentage of our economy goes to protecting the most important feature of our planet. Tiny little percent. Even if, well, just to give you an idea, if percentages aren't your thing, that's like one sip out of this fish tank. One little sip. That's how much we spend relative to that fish tank. One little sip, one little shot of water, one little spoonful. That's how much we spend. The ocean's budget is clearly too small. And it's probably not going to grow very much, realistically. All of a sudden, we're not going to adjust it to make it 5% or even 1%. It would be really great if 1% of our, our economy was devoted to environmental protection, protection of the ocean and the land and the forest. That would be like Christmas. That would be wonderful. That would be 100 times better, more than 100 times better than what we're doing now. We would celebrate that, and that's even too small. So as a result of that being out of whack, we have an ocean crisis. The ocean isn't, isn't treated the way it should be, and it isn't given the attention and the restoration that it, it could be. And our response to that crisis isn't working. Now there are, again, success stories here and there, but generally speaking, our response is, is inadequ inadequate. We're finding plastic in animals like albatross that live as far away from human beings as they possibly can on islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and their stomachs are, are full of plastic. We find plastic in small green turtles. This is a bag of plastic from one small green turtle, a four kilo green turtle from Brazil. Brazil is supposed to be pristine and beautiful, beautiful beaches and beautiful water. Their turtles are full of plastic. 3,400 pieces of plastic inside one sea turtle. There shouldn't be one piece of plastic inside a sea turtle. And that little turtle was carrying around 3,400 pieces of plastic in its gut. Where I live off the coast of California, leatherbacks migrate from Indonesia to feed on the jellyfish along the coast of California in the Monterey Bay. And what we find is an increase year on year of plastic inside leatherback sea turtles. 
the number one component being plastic bags. So plastic bags look like jellyfish. Turtles have small brains. They eat the plastic bag thinking it's a jellyfish. It's not. It can cause them to choke and die. At the very best, it just occupies a space that should be occupied by food. So no nutritional value, and it passes through their system. So what's happening? Well, our ability and interest in generating plastic is outstripping our ability to recover it. We're making more than we're, we're recovering. And that separation keeps growing year after year after year. We're making more, we're recovering, not enough. Exponential growth of plastic production and slow growth of recovery. And the stuff lasts a long time. Hundreds, if not thousands of years, it sticks around. So where does it go? Sometimes it goes in the dumps. Oftentimes it blows around or floats around and goes into our environment. And if this sounds like new news, well, it's not. 40 years ago, there was a publication in the journal Science that indicated that we had a big problem with microplastic in the ocean, 40 years ago. So our response has been kind of slow. So 40 years to respond, and we're just now starting to have this conversation about plastic in the environment after the science came out very clearly 40 years ago. So again, science doesn't solve the problem. Science just informs us. People solve problems. We've been told that recycling is the solution. The recycling pill is the one that, that we're given all the time. But recycling can't, can't possibly be the solution, especially because a lot of these materials are not really recyclable. They're downcyclable. And a lot of the plastic we, we recover gets sent to China, where it's burned for energy, which pollutes the air and the water in a different way. So when you're diving in a place and you think you're going to have a, a, a beautiful experience, instead of seeing fish or sea turtles, more and more often we're seeing plastic bags instead of wildlife. Our pharmaceuticals are going downstream and ending up in our waterways, in our lakes, in our rivers, in our fish, in the ocean, and then even back in our drinking water. Our pharmaceuticals, it's kind of incredible. Even our clothing. So you ever wear out, if you ever wear a jacket and it starts to wear out, you put it in the dryer and there's lint, all of that stuff goes somewhere. It goes downstream. Our entire economy eventually goes to the ocean. And we're finding little pieces of these fleece jackets in the ocean, polluting the ocean. Nobody wanted their jacket to pollute the ocean, but there it is, tiny pieces. And of course, pesticides and fertilizers end up going downstream as well. As a result of our economy, our oil-based economy, we have a warming and increasingly acidic ocean. Incrementally getting warmer, incrementally getting more acidic. We've got an ocean crisis. So we obviously need to rethink our relationship to the mat our materials. We need to rethink our relationship with the ocean. But what does that mean? If I say, well, okay, let's rethink. What does the word think mean to you? What do you know about how you think? What do you know about how, you, how your brain works? What do you know about how anybody's brain works? What do you know about neuroscience? If our job is to rethink our relationship with our planet and each other, tell me, what do you know about thinking? Most of us don't really know very much, it turns out. The rethinking the ocean says, sounds easy, but it's very challenging. But we can bring neuroscience to the table. So we used to understand the brain as a black box. We used to think about the brain as this black box that you could stimulate and then measure the response and then write down what happened and then stimulate it in a different way and then measure the response and write down what happened. And that's how we understood human behavior, the human brain. It was a black box. Well, that's changed a lot. We can now open that box and look inside and look at our own brains. Not by taking them out and putting them in a jar. That would be a disaster. That would be not recommended. But through different kinds of technology. So EEG technology allows us to measure the electricity in the human brain, the electricity in the neurons. 
and ask those same questions. Stimulate the brain, look at the response, but look at the response happening inside that black box. And our understanding of who we are and why we do what we do is it has advanced incredibly in, in the last 20 years. Well, we have a very long way to go. We're just barely scratching the surface of what's noble. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. Now, fMRI technology is more advanced, more complex, more expensive. It measures the oxygen in your brain, whereas EEGs measure electricity, fMRIs measure oxygen. And you can ask questions of someone's brain and see how they respond and measure that response. And we're doing that in a number of different fields, not just in the medical sciences, but in social neuroscience, asking questions about behavior, asking questions about how people interact with each other. We're even able to drill down to the level of the neuron and beginning to understand how the individual neurons work, how they make memories, how they work together, and what their different functions are. It's a, it's a great time to be alive. It's a great time to be solving problems. And I would encourage people to begin to involve neuroscience in everything you do. Marketers are doing that. There's a whole field called neuromarketing. Take the neuroscience, attach it to marketing, try to understand the consumer's brain better than they do in order to have them buy, consume things you want them to buy or consume. Maybe things that they don't want to buy or consume. And it's, it's all about pri priming in neuromarketing. So you can't, well, there's two little light blue dots in the middle, you can, are a little bit washed out, but depending on which dots, these light blue dots are near, they look like they're different size. So the one on the right looks smaller than the one on the left, those light blue dots in the middle, right? But if you really look at it, they're the same size. And they're right next to each other. But your brain thinks that they're different sized. Here's another example, a little bit weirder. <laughs> this is an omelet with caviar, sold at a restaurant in New York City. All right, big pile of caviar, big lobster omelet. They call it the, the, the zillion dollar lobster frittata. And there, there are two versions. One for $100, one for $1,000. Nobody really buys it. <laughs> it's too expensive. It doesn't really sound that good. But it's, and the purpose of having that on the menu is because it makes the three egg omelet for $22 look like a very good deal, <laughs> relatively speaking. We, and we can't help ourselves but to think that way and respond that way. And marketers are doing that all the time and understanding more and more why our brains are prone to make those kinds of mistakes. Priming is what it's called. Businesses are good at it. Businesses have neuromarketers on their team or they contract them. The Super Bowl ads that cost millions of dollars go through the neuromarketing lab before you see them and they get fixed a little bit so that they work better on your brain. Marketers, corporations, invest money in that. Why? One reason. It works. It's worth it. It's worth the money. But the ocean doesn't have a neuromarketing lab. The ocean doesn't have a, a neuroconservation lab. Nature doesn't have a neuroscience lab. And it should. Because if Coca-Cola has a neuroscience lab in their building to help them do their job, which is to sell their product, so should the ocean, I believe. I think that's fair. What we're learning is that brands are associated with emotional processes. And that's just not a, a hypothesis. That's just not a nice idea. It's being proven neurologically that we respond to brands depending on how deeply connected we are emotionally to them. Coca-Cola likes to use the tagline, open happiness. Why? Why would they use strong emotions to sell a product? One reason. Works. Should we be using strong emotions to promote saving life on planet Earth? Yes. <laughs> Should we use just emotions? No. Emotions and reason. Emotions and logic together. 
One of the neurochemicals implicated in this whole conversation is dopamine. And dopamine is involved in a lot of the decisions you make. It's involved in addiction, but it's also involved in, in, in the feeling of pleasure and pain. We can become addicted to pleasure. We can become addicted to caffeine, drugs, alcohol, gambling. Dopamine is one of the chemicals involved in that process. We need to understand dopamine if we're going to understand the things that are tearing our, our planet apart. Neuroscience is being used for a variety of different, different uses. You see it being used to study iPhone, your brain on iPhones, your brain on chocolate, your brain on red wine, your brain on logos, your brain on fear, your brain on music. There's a seven year long program at Stanford studying your brain on music. Absolutely fascinating. One of the coolest conferences I attend each year. There are books popping up all over the place. Your brain on magic, your brain on happiness, your brain on neuroplasticity, your brain's ability to change itself. It goes on and on. Your subconscious, your brain, the neuroscience of creativity and imagination, all of these different subfields of social neuroscience that are just really taking off. If you look at an analysis of all the different places neuroscience has intersected with different fields, you will find that neuroscience in sports and health, neuroscience in, in fear, neuroscience in art, neuroscience in music, but the one thing you won't find is neuroscience and the ocean. For some reason they haven't met. And the ocean is the single biggest feature of our planet. Whoops. How did that happen? How did we miss that? We know more about the neuroscience, your brain on your iPhone than we do about your brain on the ocean. Let's get, let's get it together and let's change that. Because the emotions that we have from the ocean are not new. Water makes us feel good. Being at the sea changes our mood. It changes our brain chemistry. And artists have depicted that for all of time, all over the world, across all cultures we have expressed our emotional connection with water through art. When we sit by the sea, when we sit by a river or a lake, or even a fountain, it changes our brains, for the better, usually. It calms us. Even a painting of a wave on the side of a building makes us feel an emotion. It may be a good one, it may be a little bit of a fear emotion. If you're a surfer, it certainly activates your dopamine, and you just want to go get on it. Pablo Neruda, one of my favorite poets, wrote about the ocean a lot. And sometimes you couldn't tell whether he was writing about the ocean or his lover, because they, they blended together so well through his poetry. His two favorite themes, love and the ocean, woven together in some of the most beautiful poems ever written. When we stand out there and look at water, the light from it, it's a special kind of light, goes through our eyes, into our brains, and changes our brain chemistry. Water is necessary for survival. It makes us feel good. But there's, there's something else going on there. Being near water is fun. Being on water with our friends is really fun. If, if you've ever been around kids and, you, and you've been in a Say a sandbox, if you add water, a hose, or a bucket of water, the fun goes way up. <laughs> it gets muddy, it gets messy, it gets wet. Or you turn on a sprinkler on the lawn. Or you say, okay kids, let's get in the pool. Let's jump in the water. The fun, whoosh, through the roof, goes way up. Water and fun go together. Volkswagen knows all about fun. They've got a website called thefuntheory.com, and it's all about fun. There's like almost nothing about cars. It's all about fun. Why? Because they know if they can make you feel like you're having fun, you will associate that with their brand. Right? That's a good thing. St standing out on the bow of a boat and watching dolphins swim. It feels good. It's fun. Everybody moves to the bow. Nobody wants to leave. Time passes on a different 
time scale. Everybody's happy. Everybody's giddy. Everybody's laughing. Everybody's hugging. Nobody wants it to end. It's because the ocean inspires us. Water inspires us. So when we take the brain, we take neuroscience and put it together with biodiversity conservation, we get a new field that I call neuroconservation. Bringing the neuroscientists together with the sustainability people and starting to think about how our understanding of how our brain works can inform how we do our work. Extremely important. Should be happening yesterday. And we can understand words like dignity through a different light through a less fuzzy light. As neuroscientists, what does dignity mean? What is beauty? There's a whole field called neuroesthetics, so the neuroscience of beauty, of what we think is beautiful, be it water, be it art, music, poetry. What is beauty? And compassion, the neuroscience of compassion, and empathy, and community, very important. Because if we're breaking down our compassion and we're breaking down our empathy and we're breaking down our community we better understand how to rebuild it if we can learn how to build empathy and how to build compassion as scientists and apply it to our world we can make our world better if we don't understand compassion and empathy we think they're fuzzy words, we think they're soft and unscientific, we're in trouble. We're in big trouble. A world without compassion and empathy is scary. So the environmental movement, what are our tools? What do we usually use? Well, fear, shame, and information. So the environmental movement likes to make you feel bad, likes to scare you, and likes to give you more information than you know what to do with. So much information, it maybe reminds you that you didn't really like chemistry class at all. <laughs> so, and so fear, shame, and information. And then some, you know, somebody sees you coming, oh, here comes the environmentalist, and they cross the other side of the street. Because they don't want to talk to you. Because the last time they talked to you, you made them afraid, guilty, and feeling dumb. Who wants to be part of that club? I don't even want to be part of my own club, if that's the way we do it. Right? Sometimes fear is useful, but not all the time. Because fear and stress destroy neurons. Fear and stress make us unhealthy. We don't want to make the people that we're trying to attract to our movement to put things together. We don't want to make them unhealthy. We don't want to make them sick by stressing them out all the time. Anxiety, stress causes disease. And that makes people want to shop. So now you stress people out, and what do they want to do? They want to go shopping for those clothes that end up in the ocean. For, you know, it's just, it doesn't make sense. Some people call this state of modern society monkey mind. We're running around, you wake up in the morning to the sound of your phone. You, get, you don't get out of bed, you read your email in bed. And then you go over and rush through breakfast to your first meeting, meetings all day, traffic, conversations, more email, more ads, traffic again at the end of the day, and then you go sit down and watch very stressful news that you take into your dreams and do it all over again. Right? That's monkey mind. And we're all living in some way or another in that monkey mind. Makes us eat pencils. <laughs> That causes, 60% of disease is related to stress, and stress does some really bad things to your body. All of, all of your systems. We gain weight, we break out, we have stomach problems, pancreatic problems, reproductive problems, healing problems. Stress impedes healing. I call it red mind. It's the opposite of blue, blue mind. And red mind is useful sometimes. Deadlines. A uh, lion is chasing you. It's very important to have red mind. You're driving and you have to swerve to miss an accident. Red mind is very useful. Red mind all the time causes toxic stress. It stops healing. 
it destroys DNA, and it ruins neurons. Blue mind, on the other hand, is different. Blue mind is that calming sense we feel when we're on the beach, just looking at the ocean. And I talk to people who take a week-long vacation at the ocean, and I say, what do you do when you're there? And they say, I sit, and I look at the water. I say, that's it? Well, yeah, sometimes a margarita. <laughs> Sometimes a book, but basically, essentially, sit and look at the water because it calms them down. And that's good, it heals them. Being in the water affects every cell in your body. Next time you see a body of water that you can legally jump in, <laughs> please do it. Just promise me that, that you will just get in it. Whatever this, with your clothes on, with your clothes off, with your bathing suit, Whatever the situation, get in it. And I guarantee, it may be a little inconvenient, but it will make you feel so good. It always does. It always does. Even when it's icy cold, it feels really good. When you get out there next to the water and just let the stress go, let it pull it out of you. Maybe it's your bathtub. Maybe it's a swimming pool. Maybe it's a river or a lake. Maybe it's an ocean. Just get in it and let blue mind happen. We've been having these blue mind conferences for the past three years, bringing together neuroscientists and water practitioners, water experts, and asking hard questions, new questions that we don't have answers to, putting dots on the map and trying to connect them in new ways. And it's slow going, but we have to do it. We have to understand our brains on water. It's incredibly important. So when you get out there in the water, it, it allows you to not think for a minute, just a little while. It gives your brain a break. Get the stimulation away and let your brain connect to itself. And the irony of this is that when you're out there enjoying it, your brain is still working. It's connecting to itself. And that's when you have insights. That's when you have ideas. That's when you're most creative. Artists and poets and writers go to the edge of the water to get creative, a lot. A lot of times, you, you read about that a lot. That's a good place to go because it takes away the thinking and lets your brain connect to itself. Skip that. So this is a, a, a little, little animal and this is a game I play with my kids. It's called I Spy and the one little animal saying, I spy with my little eye something beginning with the letter W, water. And that's is a game we play with the kids. And they're in this little boat, and they're surrounded by water, right? What else could it be? Is it, it's just water everywhere, and that's what it is. That's what it's like. We're on a water planet, yet we barely even realize how much water does for us, how, what it does for our brains, what it does as a cognitive surface. We haven't studied that. One thing we do know is that it, Water view will give your real estate a huge premium. Whether it's a, a condo, a house, or a hotel room, that water view, people will pay for it. They don't know why. People will give you a lot more money for your hotel room if there's a view of the water. But if you ask them why, they don't know. They say, I like it. But why do you like it? I don't know. But I need it. But why do you need it? I don't know, but here's my credit card. <laughs> And it isn't just people. Animals love water, love to look at it. And not just because they drink it and they need it for survival. Not the obvious stuff, but have you ever had a dog that did this? Sat and looked at water, just enjoyed it? Have you ever, ha ever had a pet elephant that did, <laughs> that did this? There's a great video on YouTube. I highly recommend, uh, look up on YouTube, baby elephant swimming. It will make your day. It's this baby elephant ducking its head into waves. It's one of those insane YouTube videos that a gazillion people have watched. It's kind of crazy. For me, getting out in a boat and just floating and kayaking starts the day better. Being around water sets my mind in a good direction. Being out on the water and listening to animals, listening to birds, looking for wildlife helps us relax. And relaxation is important. Relaxation is critical. 
relaxation is medicine. And we would like to get to the point where doctors are prescribing a trip to go see turtles as your medicine, to go hang out at the ocean, to look at the water for a week and relax and engage in something different. Now, Richard Louv, who wrote a book called The Nature Principle, calls these nature neurons, that when we're out in nature relaxing, having these experiences, we're creating new neurons. We're rewiring our brains in a good way, in a healthy way, in a less stressed out way. And it's incredibly important. So if stress is ruining neurons, stress is impeding healing, reducing stress helps build neurons, and advances healing. And there's a, a lot of research from the medical community that shows that patients heal better when they have less stress. You're healing, even a cut on your hand, like this one on my thumb will heal better if you're under less stress. If you have something more serious, it's even more important. So here's something a little bit more serious. This is my new friend, Martin. I, w I surfed with him all last week. Martin is from England. He was in the, the war in Afghanistan where he lost both of his legs and one of his arms. He came back and in England they don't have surf therapy, but in California, of course, they do. So Martin came to work with us in a group called Operation Surf. And he said, I was headed towards a bad path. I was literally going to become a lump and drink. I was in a bad mood, bad attitude, and I was really sad and depressed. We spent a week with Martin surfing. Taught him how to get on board, how to paddle. He had a, a, an extension for his arm with a paddle on it. And Martin is now a great surfer. His healing will probably go better. His attitude has completely changed. Martin's Facebook page, he calls himself Martin Loves the Ocean. That's his name. Martin wants to keep surfing. He wants to be healthy. He wants to work out his, his prosthetics. And he wants to keep moving forward now because of the camaraderie, the community, and his new connection with the ocean, with his, with his dopamine too, I imagine. It feels really good. So our brains are a bunch of neurons working together. And we are a bunch of brains working together. We together can do a lot more than we can do apart. Just as brains can do things that no single neuron can do, so can social networks. So brains connected with a purpose, a clear purpose, can get a lot done. And I think of Grupo Tortuguero and that connection between that, that network. Working together, understanding how our brains work apart, understanding how our brains work together, understanding that my mood affects your mood. My mood affects your mood, your mood affects your friend's mood, therefore my mood affects your friend's mood. Their mood affects their friend's mood, therefore my mood affects three people away from me's mood. How I feel that day is influencing the mood of people far away that I'll, I'll never even meet. Now, I like to talk about love a lot in neuroscience. I, I recommend that if you have a, a romantic partner, that you don't always talk about neuroscience and love together. Um, sometimes you should leave the conversation of oxytocin and dopamine and serotonin out of the romance. I tend to make that mistake a lot, and I just wanted to share that. Uh, some people don't think neuroscience is very romantic. But we can and we should talk about love as a real entity that has a basis in neuroscience and not be afraid to talk about what we love. Now, neuroscience is by no means a silver bullet. Neuroscience isn't going to solve our problems, but it's a tool in our toolbox for sustainability, for solving environmental problems, for marketing, obviously. 
all of these fields should be engaged with understanding how the human brain works. This big idea is the ocean provides economic and ecosystem services. It's something we know very well. And students here have studied that. Our ocean economy is important, and the ecosystem services from the ocean are also very important. Our climate, our food, uh, the filtration aspects of an intact mangrove forest. But our ocean also provides important but understudied cognitive services. Think about it. Think about all the stress that the ocean has sucked out of people. It's a lot. If you could measure it, it would be something like a million tons of stress, whatever that means. I just made that up. So the ocean takes a million tons of stress out of society. Imagine taking that stress and putting it back. How much would it be worth to keep that stress out? Something, probably a lot. It's probably very valuable to have that stress sucked out of our lives for our health, for our productivity, for our ability to learn, our ability to stay in school. When we get out there by the ocean, maybe with a baby sea turtle, we have these experiences that become our nostalgia, our best memories. They pull the stress from us. They begin to def define the story we tell about who we are. How much is that worth? How much is it worth to have all of those cognitive services performed for free? How much do you want to keep those services available? Interesting questions. Now I think back on the Grupo Tortuguero story that I started with and realized that little did we know we were practicing neuroconservation. We were involving these ideas about the brain, about behavior, in our efforts to protect sea turtles, to connect people, to change behavior. So Jacques Cousteau said, people protect what they love. I agree, but I would add one word, sometimes. Sometimes we protect what we love, and sometimes we don't. I think everybody in here would say, I love the ocean. We don't always protect it. So we need to figure out ways to advance the protection of what we love. Remind ourselves what water does for us cognitively, emotionally, and how much that's worth. Because it's worth a lot. Tell people about it. Talk about how you feel. And for me, getting out at the ocean with my family, getting into water of any kind, with my daughter Grace, and my daughter Julia, who's very difficult to get out of the water. She stays in the water. There's nothing better. And we stay and we stay until the end of the day, until we have to go home. The sun sets, there's no more light, the water's cold, and they still want to stay there because they feel connected to each other. They feel connected to our home. They're getting all of that cognitive service, if you will, all that love all of that dopamine, all that compassion. So I want to end with a little story and a little gift. I've shared blue marbles with, with you. I hope you have them. I hope they haven't rolled down to the front underneath the, the stairs. If anybody needs one, Anna's got a bag of them to share. And, and this is an a, a neuroscientific based teaching tool. Neuroscientists tell us that our brains prefer 3D, three dimensions, more than two dimensions. We're attracted to 3D. Obviously, that's the world we live in. Neuroscientists tell us that we prefer spheres to just about any other shape. Something about a sphere that's appealing. A round ball is appealing, it's an appealing shape. Neuroscientists tell us that blue is a very attractive color to our brains. It inspires creativity. So a three-dimensional blue sphere made out of recycled glass warmed in your hand is a nice present. It's a simple gesture of gratitude that has a neuroscientific basis. So if you hold your, your 
canica azul. <laughs> Cierto, no? It's canica azul. Okay. Hold your canica azul like this. Just do it. Come on. That's what we look like right now from a million miles away. We look that big. I did the math, más o menos, correcto? A million miles away, we look like that. We look small and blue, which reminds us that everything we do matters. We, live, we share this little blue planet. That's it. That's all we get, as far as we know. I don't know what's next. I don't know if we're going to find another blue planet that we can live on, but probably not in the near future. Let's just agree on that. So this is our home. That's it. So take your little blue home and hold it up to your eye and look at one of these spotlights. Right against your eye. Like almost touch your eye. Look inside it. Whoa, it's right. I, kind of trippy. It looks like you're underwater. Now, really close to your eye. You gotta go all the way in there. Like, try it like a microscope. And when I do this with kids, they see turtles. <laughs> And dolphins, and whales, and sharks. The boys usually see sharks. And when I do it with adults, especially serious adults like you, they see plankton. <laughs> and bacteria. And the millions of viruses that occur in the, in the water. But if you use your imagination, you might see a sea turtle as well. Because our imaginations are very, very powerful. So now I want you to take your, your blue marble and hold it to your heart. And just think of somebody for a moment that you would like to say thank you to. That you owe a thank you to. Today on Earth Day, there are many people that we know who are working really hard to fix what's broken. People like Philippe Cousteau, who took his blue marble diving under the oil spill. The Dalai Lama got a blue marble. And he whispered something to it before he gave it away. James Cameron, Avatar, Titanic, you know him? He took his blue marble to the deepest part of the ocean in the submarine that he built before he gave it away. Luis Garduño, right there. He got his blue marble in Scotland and then passed it on. So take your blue marble, I want you to put it in a safe place. Pass it on to somebody that you would like to say thank you to because gratitude is another one of our most powerful tools for sustainability, for the environment, for conservation. Saying thank you and meaning it and giving somebody a simple gift that means something to you motivates us. And guess what? It feels really good to you, too. Giving gratitude feels good to the giver and the getter. Double. It's a double bonus. It makes our brains fire up. We produce oxytocin, which connects us and builds trust. We need more of that. We need more connection and more trust. So thank you very much for inviting me to spend Earth Day with you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening to my meandering conversation about turtles and the ocean and neuroscience. I hope it all fits together in your brain. I hope you take a little piece of this blue marble with you wherever you go. And I hope the next time you see some water, you take off your clothes and you jump right in. And it feels really good. So thanks a lot.